Modernism and the Categories of Time. However, before we address the question of collective entities and their consequences for the subsumption of historiography under the more general rubric of narrative, we need to see what lessons Ricoeur's reading of literary narrative has for us, particularly as it bears on the problem of making time appear. We have already observed in advance that Ricoeur's three examples, Mrs. Dalloway, The Magic Mountain and Proust, are all staples of the modernist canon, and one does not deal with this question of periodization and form adequately by simply noting, as he does, Mendelov's distinction between tales of time and tales about time. The postmodern turn in the direction of space has made the complicity between modernism and the theme of temporality far more vivid, while at the same time sharply problematizing the distinction between the undoubtedly temporal structure of the so-called great realist novels and those of the modern period. If the question of the persistence of narrative in general across fundamental mutations in narrative structure is a crucial preliminary issue in Ricoeur's project, then it demands at least as much attention as the shift from Aristotle's Greek tragedies to those of modern times, and in particular to the structures of the novel, which everyone recognizes to be a peculiar and historically unique form. Meanwhile, another important literary question has here also been elided, namely that of the historical novel as such. Indeed, all three of the modernists' texts dealt with here can also be considered historical novels, albeit of very different types, which differ among themselves fully as much as they do from the traditional historical novel, such as Tolstoy's War and Peace. Thus, Mrs. Dalloway offers a view of London in the immediate post-World War I years, which is already obsolete when the novel appears in 1925. The Magic Mountain, 1924, clearly evokes a pre-war reality which has been swept away by that conflict, whose peacetime sequel the novel leaves open. Finally, Raoul Ruiz's great film demonstrates the degree to which Le Temps Retrouvé is already a historical novel in its own right. Paris during the war, a generic development foreshadowed by Jean saint representation of the Dreyfus case and the Zola trial. That these works all tell us something about the ways in which time can be made to appear in the novel is unquestionable, but the blurring of generic distinctions prevents us from asking the two questions I have implied above. Namely, one, whether modernism has developed its own distinctive ways of making time appear, which may also no longer be ours today, and two, whether these novels, by virtue of their historical material, do not make historical time appear in rather different ways than do the standard realistic novels about peacetime, from La Cousin Bette to Our Mutual Friend, from Madame Bovary to Middlemarch. For it is in any case a distinction between everyday existential time and the time of history which is operative here, Indeed, Ricoeur invents several useful categories to mark the intervention of the latter into the former, categories themselves inspired by Heidegger. But the latter's versions are not themselves to be found in Sein und Zeit, a work hastily written for purposes of tenure, his return to Freiburg, and, particularly in the concluding sections, exceedingly sketchy on the possibility of a level of historical time distinct from either the inauthentic time of the everyday or the authentic time of individual or existential Dasein. Indeed, the variety of temporal levels there projected by Heidegger, I count at least five, Sorge, the time of the individual Dasein, the time of work or the project, zu Handenheit, the inauthentic time of the masses, the man, the authentic time of the individual being unto death, and finally, the presumably still authentic, collective time of the generation and its mission suggests some fundamental objections to Heidegger's first system, which he can himself be thought to have anticipated and corrected in the Kerta or the turn to a philosophy of being. Still, the seminar he gave in the year following the publication of Sein und Zeit, published towards the end of his life under the title Grundprobleme der Phänomenologie, adds some useful categories to the undeveloped hints of that volume. In particular, the four categories of what he there calls Ausgesprochenezeit, or expressed time, time humanly projected and constructed in language, are suggestive. They are Bedeutsamkeit, Datierbarkeit, 
Gespanntheit and Offentlichkeit, or in the English translations, significance, dateability, spannedness, and publicness. Significance has to do with the time I need to complete my projects, that is to say, in philosophically incorrect language, that it implies a passage from my subjective desires and values to the reckoning of the time objectively necessary to implement or realize them. Significance, in other words, designates not just meaning in some vague sense, but the negotiations with the world which are necessarily for Dasein in its very life in time. Dateability then situates Dasein in the web of other lives simultaneous, long gone, or yet to come, in which individual time finds itself implicated in what we sometimes call history, namely the immense flows and multiplicities of other people and their temporalities. The awkwardly translated spannedness recapitulates the ecstatic structure of time, which constitutes Heidegger's development of Augustine and Husserl, namely the stretching of temporality's pretensions and retentions, the possibility of my now to expand and to include past and future, or, on the other hand, to shrink to some immediate corporeal attention to the sensations of the here and now. The term thus now begins to designate historicity itself as the possibility of including past and future in my time sense, or, on the other hand, losing any sense of history, finding myself reduced to the body and the present. At this point, then, the very possibility of making historical time appear is grounded in the ecstatic nature of Dasein's temporality as such, the strange way in which I am ahead of myself, and also drag my past along behind me like a ball and chain, to use Sartre's expression. Publicness, finally, is the way in which the now passes into language, or is already somehow pre-linguistic in the fact of its being able to be expressed in speech, or better yet, its impossibility of existing except as that which can be spoken or expressed. Ricoeur will then later give a structuralist twist to this complicity between the present and the language by translating it into the terms of enunciation. The present is, and can only be, he claims, the time of enunciation. Le temps de l'énonciation. And this constitutes a peculiar refinement on the older notions of temporal experience, which not only leads on into the various structuralist and post-structuralist ontologies of textuality, but also, in Ricoeur's hands, gives rise to a new complicity between the act of enunciating and the énoncé, the content of the utterance, or, in other words, the possibilities of narration as such. But it should be noted that all of these categories of Heidegger presuppose mediation, a kind of translation from the time of Dasein to the time of history, a translation which is itself, no doubt, a stegorung, a lifting up and an intensification, and very possibly also an occasion for the parting of the ways between authenticity and inauthenticity. But, in any case, such categories also suggest a kind of continuity within experience, a natural movement from individual to collective time, a way in which the temporality of Dasein is already historical and collective in advance, and simply requires the articulation and specification of categories already present in the existential. Ricoeur's alternative categories, however, which he describes as connectors between lived time and universal time, could seem to imply more of a disjunction between the two levels than do Heidegger's. Here we find, if not the brutal intervention of history into individual time, as the novels will document it, then at the very least an insertion of those categories into an everyday life which can remain innocent of them. Reflexive instruments, he calls them, and they constitute a third temporal option, which, arising from our rumination on the aporias of the phenomenology of time, consists in reflecting upon the place of historical time between phenomenological time individual or existential lived time, and the time phenomenology does not succeed in constituting, which we call the time of the world, objective time or ordinary time, a time which Heidegger ignores without, for all that, imprisoning himself in Augustine's purely subjective temporality. These three mediatory instruments, a term well chosen to distinguish them from categories as such, are the calendar, the succession of generations, and the archives, or traces. But the deployment of these instruments would seem to presuppose or to depend on a particular kind of space, 
the possibility of a public space as opposed to a private one, a space in which the intersection of historical and existential temporalities can happen as an event. It should be clear that this event is not the same as the event of history itself. Here, perhaps, we might have begun our differentiation of these modernist historical novels from the traditional ones celebrated by Lukács, which do indeed attempt to take on the great historical convulsions head-on and to represent them directly. As in the burning of Moscow, or even Fabrice's failure to recognize the Battle of Waterloo as a named event. But in Mrs. Dalloway, the event is not World War I as such. It is the moment in which the level of history becomes visible in the everyday of the immediate post-war period, in which it suddenly and brutally, in the space of the joycy and single day, intersects the peacetime world of the household and of the reception Mrs. Dalloway has planned for that very evening. And the mark of this intersection is that it also awakens a series of other temporalities which are not on the same level or in the same rhythm or duration as the agonizing four years of wartime. Thus Septimus no doubt remembers the war in the trenches which haunt and torment him in Wolfe's version of what the period baptized shell shock. But Mrs. Dalloway herself remembers her childhood and youth, reawakened by the return of Peter from his imperial service in British India which he himself also remembers in a personal way, even though it inscribes its own larger public temporality on this novel, which thereby becomes as anti-imperialist as it is anti-war and pacifist. We do not need to assert any kind of causality in order to affirm the intimate relations between the eruption of these temporalities and the public ones inscribed first in the tolling of Big Ben, the national time, or in the passage of the Prime Minister's limousine, the time of the state. To these we may add the time of the male power structure, as it is incarnated in the authority of the society doctor, whose decision to isolate Septimus is responsible for the latter's suicide. And also the way in which the great temporal coexistence of the reception is honeycombed with the time of gossip and rumour, brushed by occasional vague perspectives of the future of the family and of children. All of these temporalities then presided over by what seem to be moments of timelessness. What is to be noted here is less the unification of these disparate temporalities than rather their surcharge and overlap, and the multiple intersections with which they endow the immense power centre of empire whose essential blindness is quite different from the lucid experience of dependency and subalternity recorded in the colonized space of a Dublin under military occupation in Ulysses, which otherwise furnishes the formal model for Wolfe's experiment. The spatial precondition of the Magic Mountain is in many ways the opposite of this one, for it presupposes an absolute and well-nigh hermeneutic separation from those flatlands in which history will shortly begin to take place. Here the temporal heterogeneities we have begun to observe in Mrs. Dalloway are registered in a very different formal manner, namely in the carefully segmented and uneven temporal durations in which the novel consists, and which deploy chapter lengths and narrative divisions to express the tensions between hours, days, weeks and years a unique enclave of multiple temporalities from which the ordinary, common or vulgar time of the flatlands is explicitly excluded, even though it includes both the existential and the historical, both the everyday of peacetime and the wartime of history yet to come. It is as though the instrument of temporal registration, which is man's novel, demanded a radical secession from ordinary time in order the better to make it appear as an object in its own right. Ricoeur's analysis, however, makes the revealing point that this is achieved by a peculiar alteration in the very process of reading and interpreting the novel, which refuses to be reduced to any one interpretive option. Thus, we may certainly take it as a philosophical exploration of time itself, yet that reading periodically finds itself interrupted by the barometer of the temporalities of sickness and the body in fever but also, at other moments, by ruminations on the fate of Europe as its elites stumble and blunder passionately into war. Each of these alternating temporal options constructs a different aspect of time, to use Husserl's technical term, a variety reinforced by those moments of timelessness, also isolated by recur, which, in my opinion, serve a very different and more narrative function than the positing of God's eternal timelessness in Augustine.
Yet, it is difficult to argue away the moments of timelessness in Proust as well, those famous moments of bliss and blinding recollection of a present from the past outside of the dreary everyday of jealousy, or the frustration of a vacuous high society and its rituals, along with the gnawing personal defeats as Marcel's literary ambitions sink fatally into neurasthenia. But Ricoeur's reading of these eternities is deployed not to develop some new or old theory of Proustian temporality, as in Poulet, for example. Rather, the old interpretation of Proust in terms of involuntary memory and ultimate revelation is played off against the newer Deleuzian reading of A la Recherche in terms of signs and their decipherment. And it is this conflict between two incommensurable readings which not only constitutes Ricoeur's interpretation, but also moves us on towards an understanding of the way time in Proust is made to appear by means of the very heterogeneity of these interpretations and the temporalities they superimpose on each other. For the traditional interpretation in terms of quest and revelation, in effect erases the entire novel that has preceded the ending, the account of a false time in which the relationship of artistic production to individual experience was not understood or, better still, was repressed. The story of that repression then suddenly becomes of little interest in the light of the adoration perpetuelle, the characters themselves being revealed as a mere teratology of deformed and pitiful pathological specimens. But on the Deleuzian reading, the work breaks down into a series of spots of time, or hermeneutic occasions and perceptions. All are equal in value to each other. There can be no particular hierarchy in the deeply satisfying labor by which each one is expressed and translated, transfigured in language itself, such that it only then, in this second time of writing, happens for the first time. It is only in appearance that these minute phenomenologies lead up to any ultimate reflexivity or self-consciousness about the process, which had to have been understood before Proust began writing in the first place. Ton de l'énoncé, ton de l'énonciation. As in the standard 18th century references Ricoeur first used in his discussion of this distinction, Fielding, Stern, the letter novel as such, what is at stake here is really less a conflict of interpretations than an interference between two kinds of temporality, or, if you prefer, two kinds of reading time. Proust's voluminous pages contain many more kinds, however, as the great movements of expansion and contraction, the eternal luncheons lasting hundreds of pages, the leaps from period to period, testify. What we have not yet sorted out is the way in which the existential and historical times intersect in such works, and in particular how a multiplicity of existential times, an opening up of the representational fan to register and include a variety of personal temporalities, might be expected to pick up the vibrations of the more properly historical ones or whether some external force, events, social structure, the awakening of the collective, is required for historical time to become manifest. We thus return to Recur's three temporal mediations, the calendar, the generations, the trace, for an x-ray or CAT scan of the temporalities at work in these novels. The calendar marks the spot, no doubt, of the measurability of time, of that Bergsonian spatiality and visibility which he opposed to some deeper, more natural or organic flow, in a vitalist dualism no longer philosophically very stimulating after Heidegger, or even after Deleuze's own revival of Bergsonianism, and an interpretive code no longer generally acceptable for Proust either. Yet calendar time, both public and galactic all at once, does suggest that it may have been premature for Ricoeur to exclude objective time from his field. Ricoeur has in effect painted himself into a corner by insisting on the replacement of precisely that Aristotelian time of the rotation of the stars by some lived phenomenological or Augustinian temporality. This replacement then necessarily draws the objective time of the universe back into our own subjectivities, where it necessarily takes on the form of a projection or a fantasy, or even a myth, a dimension Ricoeur acknowledges at the same time that he repudiates it. Prehistorical or archaic time, perhaps, the pre-modern, the superstitious. But as Ricoeur's trilogy is also haunted by death, in discussions that run from commode to Heidegger and on into ethics, 
It might be worthwhile asking ourselves whether there are not intersections of objective and existential time to be determined which are objective events that are at the same time unassimilable or incomprehensible. At that point, not only does death itself come as a marker of that incompatible external time of the world, but also a range of just such interventions shows up on the narrative apparatus of the novel. The ground base of sickness and the feverish body in Thomas Mann, for example, would certainly seem to mark the outer limit of what subjectivity can interiorize. Pathos is here reserved for the sickness and death of the others, like that of cousin Joachim, but Hans' own fevers happen to him from the outside, and are certainly very different in character from his historic death in the trenches of World War I, if indeed he does die during that conflict. Sickness, as a corporeal experience, is not particularly vivid in Proust, who paradoxically knew a good deal more about it personally, but ageing certainly is, as in the Belle de Tête of the final volume, we will come back to it under the rubric of the generations, a category which seeks precisely to recuperate this purely material and biological fact for historical experience. What is even more relevant as a marker of the geological time of organic life on Earth is the omnipresence of the zoological in Proust, which not only betrays the operation of kinship in the clan, no doubt a more historical and social category, but rejoins the fact of ageing as an inevitable emergence of hereditary structure from out of the individuality of the young and active. Thus, the beak-like features of the Guermont, as they re-emerge in the older Saint-Loup before his death on the front, draw biological fatality up into the text and into the experience of time in the present. An even deeper layer of reality than the family likenesses that mark this caste of people more decisively than their mental and verbal tics. The metaphorics of animality here is indeed very different from that of Proust's great mentor Balzac, for whom the animal kingdom of human society is a place of vices and virtues, of ferocities and vulnerabilities, rather than a realm of collective species evolving out of the mists of a time in which the history of France itself is but a passing episode. Prodel's Long Touré. This objective time of the organic as it replaces that galactic time whose markers, the stars, we so rarely live with in the age of electric lights, is however itself scarcely compatible with Ricoeur's calendar, no matter what kind of numbers the biologists try to use to convey it. The human calendar is not a space of sheer number or numerical succession either. We may recall here, to anticipate a more extensive discussion later on, one of Levi Strauss's cheaper debating points against Sartre's historicism. Calendar time here is a grid consisting of parallel lines of dots, which serves Levi Strauss as a demonstration of the way in which what Sartre calls history is a jumbled superimposition of very different models of time, the centuries, the years, the revolutionary days, all of which have their distinct tempos, which are not susceptible to any grand synthesis or unified theory of history. From our own standpoint here, however, this very heterogeneity confirms the intuition to be developed, namely that it is out of this jumbled superimposition of different kinds of temporal models that history does in fact emerge. Ricoeur's more decisive insight about the calendar, however, has to do with the operative presence in it of what he calls the axial event, a mythic or absent starting point which provides the occasion for a year one whether that be the Hegira, the death of the last emperor, the birth of Christ, the conjunction of the stars, or whatever is taken as the zero degree at which the clock can begin ticking, and calendar time again begin its long countdown. Even chronological time as such, the much maligned linear time of the chronicles or of the reified nows, lined up in a row that extends to infinity without becoming any less spatial, is not what it seems and conceals within itself that indispensable reference to a transcendent moment, which is neither a beginning in the narrative sense, nor is it out of time altogether, like the various eternities of Ricoeur's philosophical and literary references, but rather endowed with the primordiality of the event and ideologically charged to express the inception of something new in the world, something the humble calendar faithfully promises to record and keep track of. So, in all three of our modernist novels, World War I stands as the axial event, even where, owing to the convolutions of these forms, it occurs in the present tense, in Proust, or even in the future, as in man, 
but it is as if this brutal temporal break multiplied smaller and more ghostly versions of itself along the continuum. So the various personal or childhood pasts in Wolf take on a portentous, if faint, sense of possibilities missed, while in Man, minor events in the past suddenly re-emerge like premonitions in a secular replay of those biblical typologies in which events in the Old Testament announce and allegorically foretell the New. It is in Proust, however, that, paradoxically, the axial event never fully happens. To be sure, a Proustian experience is, by definition, an incomplete event, something like Ernst Bloch's emptiness of the present. Then, too, the war itself is not yet over by the time the novel ends. Instead, it functions as a transformation of Paris and some final degradation of everyday life and its original cast of characters. Yet, the war replicates in its reshuffling of the guest lists that earlier event which now does prove to be axial, the Dreyfus case itself, which the young novelist first proposed to seize sur le vif in Jean saint but which instructively eluded any direct, full-faced representation. Indeed, it is as if the axial event, which was the indispensable precondition for the existence of a historical continuum, but which in reality served to disrupt synchronic time, and reveal the latter as a heterogeneous pattern of surcharged layers, is mostly visible by its absence, and evoked most intensely there, where it is strongly argued against. So it is that among the historians, Fernand Pradel's tripartite narrative structure in the Mediterranean book has as its secret mission to undermine the historical significance of the Battle of Lepanto, and indeed to demystify the legend of this event as the great turning point in the struggle between Spain and the Ottoman Empire, very much in keeping with the very program and mission of the Annal School, which, as we shall see, was intent on sapping the very category of the event as such, and of the narrative history which issues from it. Meanwhile, the strong political form of this onslaught on the very category of the event as such, only foreshadowed by Levi Strauss's polemic with Sartre, to which I return, finds its embodiment in François Furet's anti-communist attack on the centrality of the French Revolution in French political consciousness, and his attempt to erase it from the slate of the present, without, for all that, substituting an equivalent. For the French Revolution was an axial event, if there ever was one. The analogous efforts of English historians to dismiss the significance of their own revolution pale in contrast. In any case, Ricoeur's theorization has the merit of insisting on the reality of the axial event, despite the fact that it is, in another sense, absent and even non-existent or mythic. As a principle of structuration, in other words, it can never be considered a mere subjective projection or collective fantasy, although it is itself the very centre of ideology as such. The second of Ricoeur's categories, that of the generations, was apparently first foregrounded and theorized by Wilhelm Dilthey in a famous essay footnoted by Heidegger in Sein und Zeit. The latter publication, hastily redacted, disposes of the category with a brief but ominous mention of the mission of this his own generation. We now know, however, that his teaching, both before and after Hitler's accession to power, was only too explicit about the nature of that mission and the duty of his students to fulfill it. The concept of the generation, however, is perhaps grasped as a category rather than as an idea with specific content. It has less to do with premonitions of mortality and the supersession of the superannuated by the young and vigorous, Fry's very definition of comedy as such, than with an opening onto the existence of other people and of the collective. Less than the occasion for intergenerational hostility or envy, what Ricoeur seems to mean when he so frequently deplores schism, it is rather to be seen as the coexistence and solidarity, for good or ill, of my contemporaries. And in this sense, we must suggest that not every generation feels itself to be a true generation, and that there are moments of dispersal, seriality, mere temporal vegetation, in which people do not particularly feel themselves united in this unique, an active contemporaneity. Indeed, it is to be doubted whether a generation can be defined passively by what it suffers from without. Thus it seems less plausible that the victims of the Holocaust are to be considered to have been a generation than rather several waves of contemporaries who followed them, the founders of Israel and after them, the still later contemporaries of various nations who revived the memories of the Holocaust and redefined themselves as Jews.
The experience of generationality is, however, a specific collective experience of the present. It marks the enlargement of my existential present into a collective and historical one, one somehow associated, if not by specific collective acts, then at least, as Heidegger rightly suggests, by that intimation of praxis which is the mission. Avant-garde's are, so to speak, the voluntaristic affirmation of the generation by sheer willpower, the allegories of a generational mission that may never come into being, or, perhaps one should even say, that can never come into being. At the same time, it is perhaps not so paradoxical that generationality also involves a struggle against the present, insofar as the present is not yet that space of collective presence which the future must be summoned up to be. En traverse un tunnel, l'époque, c'est lui. Long le dernier, rampant sur la cité avant la gare, toute puissant du virginal palais central, qui courant, mal informé celui que se créerait son propre contemporain, désertant, usurpant, avec impudence égale, quand du passé c'est ça, et que tard d'un futur, ou que les deux se remêlant, perplexement en vue de masquer l'écart. Mallarmé's search for the present, in an essay which opposes and combines political action and writing, is reproduced by the generation, which, like Heideggerian temporality itself, is always ahead of itself, or lagging behind, but without benefit of any temporal plenitude in the now as such. This is perhaps the moment to evoke a curious discussion of that neutralization of the present in narrative, which Recur rightly associates with Proust. The occasion is Harold Weinrich's reduction of the past tenses to mere signals of narration. Does not the signal marking the entry into fiction make an oblique reference to the past through the process of neutralization, of suspension? Husserl discusses at great length this filiation by neutralization. Following him, Eugen Fink defines Bild in terms of the neutralization of mere presentification, Ver gegen Vartigen. By this neutralization of the realist intention of memory, all absence becomes, by analogy, a quasi-past. Every narrative, even of the future, speaks of the irreal as if it were past. How could we explain that narrative tenses are also those of memory, if there were not, between narration and memory, some metaphorical relation produced by neutralization? If so, generationality itself becomes a kind of narrative we seek to impose on a recalcitrant present, mastering it in view of a triumphant story of the future. Contemporaneity is perhaps what is achieved last, while the early presence of the others not only gives rise to the mirage and the reality of the big other, it also generates my own individual subjectivity. This shadowy presence of all the others behind individual figures is what equips narrative with its allegorical possibilities, of which the sense of the type, if not the stereotype, is only one modulation. As the conjuncture of the generations varies with the historical situations themselves, the only narrative generalization that can be ventured is the hypothesis that they will become more visible in moments of intense conflict, in a kind of rivalry of temporalities whose struggle for power consists in the claim of each on the present of time. The difficulty in representing such generational intersection is then to be identified in the reification of the other, his immobilization in a single moment of age, his assimilation to that mask of permanence which Proust's Bal de Tête seeks to dissolve back into the multiple selves stationed along the unimaginable and unrepresentable timeline. But this is a struggle against the immense privilege of the present, Hegel, which obliterates its multiple pasts and incorrigibly sustains forgetfulness. Historiography also represses the generational fact, which, however, sinks to a kind of metaphysical presupposition or steady, unheard accompaniment, rather than disappearing altogether. In Marx, generational time is replaced by labor time, as well as by the circulation time of capital, which can be said to be capitalism's objective or cosmological temporality, despite the fact that revolutions are made by young people and by women. In revolutions, indeed, the temporality of the generations is concentrated in a single instant, time's livid final flame, which is no doubt 
another way of obliterating it. Yet, if the present is the time of enunciation, the present of the generation is also the time of collective enunciation, of the attempt to say we, after the awakening of the us. In this sense, generationality also marks the attempt to insert the subject into the collective by seeking to enlarge the former to the dimensions of the latter. Here, Recur's invocation of reading is an appropriate figure, inasmuch as it now grasps the temporalities of the novel as what have to be somehow reactivated by those of the reader. Recur's Mimesis III thus becomes a process of contact and mutual restructuration between two complex temporal systems, which I have elsewhere characterized as a four-term rather than two-term intersection, where the reader and the writer in effect serve as the mediation between a contact between two historical situations and moments. History is, of course, most clearly the place in which we are called upon, not merely to confront a certain present of the past, but also to summon up the past of that present and the future it momentarily included in the form of anxiety and anticipation, of fear and desire. The horizon of expectations of Gadamer can mean little unless it includes the way in which that present of a given past must be imagined as bearing its own unique burden of past and its own uniquely feverish hopes and projects within itself. The modern novel involved the reconquest of these multiple temporalities and the effort to invent a narrative language which could suggest that existential present of its characters as their experience outside itself in all three temporal ecstasies. Modern literary historiography then seeks to step outside that invention and to include the unique temporalities of the authorial situation itself within an increasingly complicated act of reading, in which the literary work itself, the twenties of Wolf, Mann and Proust, has itself become somehow generational. Yet, it is an act easily enough disguised as an aesthetic operation in some pure or eternal present. Recur's final sight of temporal intersection, the trace, makes such occultations of the past impossible, owing to its peculiar ontology, in which being and not being coexist in a fashion unconceptualizable by philosophy. This is an aporia, if there ever was one. For the trace exists simultaneously in the present and in the past. It is too easy to evoke this double life in terms of the sign, whose mysteries no doubt derive from it, unless you are, wrongly, willing to grant the sign of full being as an object in the present. One is tempted to say, as Recur does for time itself, that there can be no pure phenomenology of the trace, but that it has at least this in common with the sign, that it must be read, deciphered, tracked like a clue, interpreted like a missing narrative. It demands a reconstruction in which it would itself, qua trace, disappear utterly. These are, as it were, the black holes that honeycomb the present without being visible. And if fictional narrative can make them appear by means of this or that narrative of detection, or of so-called involuntary memory, most historiography, say for the history of history, seems to have passed through them to the other side before its stories begin to be told. The notes have been taken, the registers examined, the archives now closed. These were then the mediatory categories whereby existential time can be grasped as historical. Mediatory codes, perhaps, in which the temporality of Dasein can be written or rewritten in terms of this or that version of history the generation, the nation, the collectivity, or however we wish to formulate this elusive dimension ideologically. But this very way of putting it suggests its own questions, namely whether that existential temporality is historical through and through, and simply demands translation into historical terms, or whether the possibility of a mediation with history is itself discontinuous and only breaks into private life at fitful or intermittent moments, which can themselves be euphoric or nightmarish. Or finally, whether the temporality of history is not situated on another dimension altogether, the collective, which therefore demands a privileged situation in which to reveal itself. With this third possibility, we seem to have moved from some quotidian hermeneutic towards the more transcendental model of the Heideggerian Kera, in which, from time to time, the empirical experience of existence, Siendes, the ontic variety of what exists within the world, is suddenly enveloped and eclipsed by the fleeting glimpse of being itself, das Sein, 
whose fundamental property, if one can use such language, is to wax and wane, to withdraw in the very moment of its self-disclosure and unfolding, to be accessible only in the form of a felt absence. But if this is the form of recurs interrogation, then it slowly becomes clear that two questions have here been superimposed, that of the appearance of time and that of the appearance of history. Meanwhile, both questions have been ambiguated by a second or dialectical axis, a new dimension of ambivalence, in which a passive receptivity of the experience of being or totality has the possibility of giving way to its active provocation, whether on the part of the philosopher or the artist, not to speak of the political leader. In a fallen world, in which the experience of the grace of this opening is contingent and seemingly arbitrary, a new question arises, namely whether it can be made to appear, and whether the preconditions of the calling up of such a dimension can be actively implemented, even if they are theoretically known. But this question cannot be addressed until the answer to the first one is clarified. It would certainly seem that Ricoeur's humanist and anthropomorphic framework limits him to the study of individual time itself. His interrogation centers on the problem of whether we can make time itself appear, and how. It does not, despite his historiographic materials, appear to posit some properly historical time, or in other words, history itself, about which one might ask the analogous but quite distinct question, how we might make history appear as such. Indeed, the historiographic materials would seem rather to be pressed into service to illuminate the literary ones, whose machinery of temporal intersections and the superposition of the various temporal dimensions are given priority in this search for time. But is there such a thing as time itself? Are there not many varieties of temporality whose attempted unification in a single concept is the source of innumerable false problems, ultimately accounting for the failure of philosophy to overcome its endless aporias? The answer to this lies in the structure of the question, which is organized around a personification. That supreme actor, time, le ton, who makes his appearance in Proust's last pages. But such a figure is always, according to Ricoeur, a sign of implotment, and therefore demands an answer commensurate with the three mimeses, with the translation of reality into narrative rather than on the barren cosmological level of world time, the time of the stars and the universe, from which it can receive no response. Thus, in an echo of Sartre's response to the question about the unification of history, or of the emergence of the personification called history, if you like, we must answer not that time is one, but that it becomes one. It wins its absolute status as a personification by being unified, and being unified, Recur might have added, by narrative mimesis itself. The unification of time is thus the correlative of the closure of the work, it is what makes of multiple discords a single discordant concordance. But this formula, as we have seen, is misleading to the degree to which it still suggests an older, modernist, if not even traditional, conception of what concordance and unification might be in the first place. What we actually observe in the novels, however, is the multiplication of the temporalities they collect and include, a multiplicity which goes well beyond the dualism of subjective and objective time, of my individual experience of time passing, and the objective placement of the moment in the universe of stars and galaxies. Nor is it productive at this stage to reduce to this simple opposition the range of temporal levels we confront in narrative, which include that of daily life and that of collective history, that of short-term memory and that of the long-term, what Husserl distinguished as retention and recollection that of other people, and that of the nation, or the dead, or the human race, that of the project, and that of a fixation on the past, Heidegger's authentic and inauthentic time, Thomas Mann's moments of eternity, post-modernity's acceleration, so rapid it seems to have been suspended in a kind of freeze frame, as opposed to the slowness of peasant life trudging the spring furrows in Van Gogh's or Heidegger's wooden shoes. These multiple temporalities are not primarily distinguished by their content, but rather constitute so many different and distinct forms of time, which can only be superimposed or surcharged on each other, but not fused together in one overarching form, or even two opposing ones, 
Each of these temporalities presents a distinct philosophical problem in its relations with the others. The literary text, however, seems to jumble them pell-mell together in an immense omnibus of time frames, whose random and multiple intersections are regulated only by the implotment and accessible only to narrative interpretation and not philosophical systematization, to narrative intelligence rather than abstract reason. The interruption of some inner personal time of daydreaming and free association by the metallic vibrations of Big Ben would not seem to solve any of our aporias, but rather produce them in the first place. But this is for recur, or so it seems to me, very precisely the privilege of literature over philosophy, about which we recall that there can be no pure phenomenology of time. Indeed, the superiority of literature over philosophy, if one can put it in such trivializing language, lies in the fact that the latter generally takes its function as the solution of aporias and the overcoming of contradictions, whereas the mission of the former consists in producing them in the first place. This is the point at which we may return to the question of Aristotle's catharsis in a new way. It becomes the name of what results from the transmutation of real phenomena, good or bad fortune, real suffering, into their aesthetic representations. But it is important to distinguish here between some banal account of mere aesthetic effects and that process of aestheticization, that transformation of reality into aesthetic representation, which is an act and an operation, indeed a form of production. The first alternative simply registers the existence of a strange kind of object, among other objects, which turns out to have unique effects which other existence lack. The latter, however, is something we do to reality, and its resultant transformation is no less real than the objects on which it is performed. This operation can now be better specified by abandoning the term aesthetic, already suspiciously redolent of art appreciation and luxury or leisure activity, and returning to our starting point in narrative itself. For implotment gives a far more vigorous and productive sense of this operation, whereby, at one and the same time, something happens to its initial quotient of misery. Catharsis, as Ricoeur reads it, is the name for that transformation of affect, most often traditionally grasped in terms of discharge or purgation, or at best, purification. Dismissive formulations which give us to understand that we have merely distanced ourselves from what was strongly and disturbingly felt, and have now managed to get rid of the oppressive feelings somehow. Implotment has, by now, however, absorbed cognitive connotations from its association with historiography, and the gamble is that it can now be grasped as an activity of construction and the production of a new reality an enterprise with at least as much dignity and practical value as, say, the Freudian talking cure. That value will be enhanced if we now return to the philosophical side of the matter and re-examine the impact of catharsis, grasped in this new way, on the conceptual stalemates of the apparatic. Indeed, Ricoeur's patient and extensive demonstrations suggest not only that time can never be represented, a conclusion already reached by Kant, but also that the gap between cosmological and existential or phenomenological time can never be closed by philosophical conceptualization, but remains, at whatever level of complexity, an aporia resistant to mere thinking. The narrative view then presupposes a skepticism about solutions, which nonetheless places a premium on the rigorous demonstration of their impossibility. This is the sense in which we may speak of the production of such aporias, a formula suggested by Althusser's language, in another context, that of ideology in literature, in which he says, Ce que l'art nous donne à voir, nous donne donc dans la forme du voir, du percevoir et du sentir, qui n'est pas la forme du connaître, c'est l'idéologie dont il naît, dans laquelle il bain, dont il se détache et ton carte, et à laquelle il fait allusion. »
This view endows art with a cognitive and constructional function, consistent with its own specific mode of existence and not imported from philosophy. And it suggests a useful way of grasping the nature of the operation of implotment, now understood as the production of aporias, their demonstration before us, as one might demonstrate a new machine and put it through its paces, and thereby the modified status of their being, which the enigmatic word catharsis also seeks to convey. In other language, art's function is to produce contradictions and to make them visible. The formulations of Levi Strauss, that of imaginary solutions to real contradictions, or closer to home, real toads in imaginary gardens, Marianne Moore, is satisfactory to the degree to which we grasp such solutions, as ways in which the contradiction in question is deployed and offered for examination in all its discord or dissonance, for it is important, in the light of our discussion of postmodern differentiation, to forestall the harmonizing overtones of words like resolution. The literary inventory of these aporias then comes as a better alternative to the repeated demonstration of the impotence of philosophy than any retrenchment in skepticism and nihilism. The repeated failure to make time appear in some pure state, to think it head-on as an unmediated phenomenon, most recently again in Husserl, thereby gives way to a collection of all the symptoms of time, the traces it leaves of its invisible omnipresence. But those traces, and this is the second conclusion we may now draw from Ricoeur's great project, can be identified and registered only at the intersections of several distinct temporalities. Even within the most subjective reduction of temporal experience, the thing itself only becomes visible at moments of temporal coexistence, of simultaneity, of the contemporaneity without coalescence, of several distinct subjectivities at once. Note, without returning to the inevitable reference to Einstein, we find a luminous reflection on the growing simultaneity of the social in Benedict Anderson, Imagined Communities, 1991, originally published 1983. Our own conception of simultaneity has been a long time in the making, and its emergence is certainly connected, in ways that have yet to be well studied, with the development of the secular sciences. But it is a conception of such fundamental importance that, without taking it fully into account, we will find it difficult to probe the obscure genesis of nationalism. What has come to take the place of the medieval conception of simultaneity a long time is, to borrow again from Benjamin, an idea of homogeneous empty time, in which simultaneity is, as it were, transverse, cross time, marked not by prefiguring and fulfillment, but by temporal coincidence, and measured by clock and calendar. Why this transformation should be so important for the birth of the imagined community of the nation can best be seen if we consider the basic structure of two forms of imagining which first flowered in Europe in the 18th century, the novel and the newspaper. For these forms provided the technical means for re-presenting the kind of imagined community that is the nation. End note. But it is precisely this capacity of the literary text to make time itself appear, even fitfully, that also constitutes the superiority of the postmodern aesthetic over its modernist predecessor in this respect. For while the latter pursued that mirage of unification which it still shared with philosophy, the former chose to embrace dispersal and multiplicity, and the slogan, Difference Relates, which I have evoked above, turns out to be the best working program for this deployment of temporal levels we have found to be required for any mediated approach to time in the absence of the thing itself. The works in question not only distend in Augustine's language and stretch in Heidegger's, they strain painfully to touch the scattered dimensions in which time manifests itself, like so many walls the body's extended arms manage to brush with outstretched fingers. And this corporeal metaphor may stand in for that ultimate human agency Recur identifies as mimesis three, or in other words, reading. Reading is then the momentary and ephemeral act of unification in which we hold multiple dimensions of time together for a glimpse that cannot prolong itself into the philosophical concept.